Aloha. Aloha. Do you remember your very, very first job? For many of us, a first job was something like cutting grass or babysitting or maybe getting a paper route back in my day. I remember actually once helping a friend with his paper route, uh, and that was when I was lived in Texas as a child. I was so impressed, actually, that some company trusted this guy, my friend Ryan, to actually deliver the news to other people. <laughs> this guy who could be dared into doing just about anything as we were children together. But as we would sit and watch wrestling, I was really into professional wrestling around that time in my life. Uh, we would have all the newspapers spread out in front of us when I would help him sometimes. And they were the ones that needed to be delivered either that evening or the next morning. So we would look at them and take into account uh, the expected rainfall coming in that day so that we could decide whether to use just a rubber band or a plastic sleeve so that the papers would be protected. And as we loaded those papers into his bike, and as we darted our ways through the neighborhoods, delivering these papers, doing the work that we were entrusted to do, we felt something, something wonderful in knowing that we were earning a wage, that we could make our own decisions about how best to deliver these papers in the most efficient way. And then we could spend our hard-earned money when it came. Now, looking back, it strikes me today that Ryan never actually shared any of those earnings with me. <laughs> but part of helping him with his job was so that we could spend more time together doing whatever it is that fifth graders in Texas did. So tomorrow is Labor Day. And if you spend much time at all listening to the radio, reading newspaper inserts, you'll know that it's a great weekend to get a deal on a new mattress or that new car you've been thinking about. You've also learned that maybe uh, for Labor Day, everywhere we turn, and for others, uh, tomorrow really marks the first day of summer, though not officially. It's the day that marks the end of being allowed to wear light-colored suits, which I almost put on this morning and was saved to told to wear this instead. Uh, <laughs> Also, the time where, in other parts of the world, people stop wearing sandals for formal occasions. And for still others, it's that day that marks the beginning of school. So, there are many, many things that Labor Day has come to represent, but the one thing that it seems not to represent so often, not to call to mind for so many, is why this is a holiday at all. Historians have come to agree that it was in New York City in 1882 that the very first Labor Day celebration took place. The Central Labor Union in New York was the organizer of this event, which was meant to be a demonstration and a picnic. We still do lots of picnics at Labor Day, so we're pretty close. And the form of the demonstration was a parade through the streets of New York City, featuring many, many of the laborers and their families in the city. And then there was a picnic, complete with amusements for all the families of those who participated in this demonstration, really like a carnival atmosphere. And much of this took place in and around Union Square in New York. Now, as a matter of personal ignorance, I confess that I lived in New York City for about a decade, and I never pieced together the origin of the name of Union Square until I was working on this sermon for you. And I suspect I'm not alone. This day, out, this day out for all union families in New York in 1882 was not the beginning of struggle for workers, not at all by any stretch. It was actually a celebration of the accomplishments that many of those workers had made. The struggle had been going on for a much, much longer time, including right here in Hawaii. According to sources at the University of Hawaii, Labor, or a day's work, here when this land was under the rule of the chiefs, had a very particular purpose in the way that people lived. In those earlier times, the Makaayana were the group of people who lived under the rule of the chiefs. Like many agriculture-based societies throughout time, 
early Hawaiian society was organized among these chiefs who controlled their certain lands. Now, the Makaayana were folks who, well, they weren't the chiefs or the family of the chiefs. They worked for them. So part of the arrangement for living on land under the control of that chief was that each member of the Makaayana would have their own plot of land to work. Now, most people didn't have enough land to grow all the different kinds of food that they liked and that they preferred in their diet. So different families grew different things, and then they shared what they had grown with those families and friends around them. And it wasn't like just bringing it to someone. You could just walk onto someone's land and take what was needed and share that. So the labor was divided in this way to be sure that everyone would have all that they needed. But in exchange for this plot of land, those who were working it would give six days of labor every month to the chief who controlled and protected that land. Now, some historians also note that the, the folks working that land would fight in wars and battles waged by the chief and others. They also would pay tributes at times from their own lands, like taxes, delivering uh, goods to the chief. But the primary basis of that agrarian economy in early chief-controlled Hawaii was really a day's work. Well, really, six days of work. And it was the arrival of Captain Cook at the beginning of the 18th century and all those who followed at the beginning of the 19th century who brought to these lands the chance to trade for manufactured goods. But to receive these goods, those who controlled the land, the monarchy and the chiefs, needed something to trade. Iliahi, which the newly arriving traders called sandalwood, was something that grew plentifully in the islands and something these new traders and merchants very much prized. You've got something I want, I've got something you want, and that's how you strike a bargain. But to hold up their end of the bargain that they struck, the chief started to send the Makayana into the fields to cultivate and harvest the Iliani. And with this decision, a new form of economy began to take hold here in Hawaii, the production for use economy, a system that allowed workers to provide for themselves from their own lands, producing food that they eat and that they share, a system that required six days a month of labor to the chief, a system that not only allowed for open-handed, open-hearted sharing, but depended on it. That system ended and the production for profit system took its place. In this system, goods are produced for sale. And after selling the goods, the profit from the sale is then used to buy more goods. We're familiar with this. It's the world that we live in today. And in that system, those who stood to profit from the Iliani trade discovered that by demanding more and more of those who were harvesting it for them meant more and more profit for those who controlled the land. Kamehameha I ruled at these times, and his chiefs began to work the Makayana even harder and harder. And one observer, part of a journey made by many missionaries throughout the time who arrived, described a scene that he witnessed in 1822. He described seeing more than 2,000 people, in his words, coming down from the mountains to deposit their burthens in the royal storehouses and then depart to their homes, wearied that their unpaid labors yet unmurmuring in their bondage. In fact, the condition of the common people is that of slaves. They hold nothing which may be taken from them by the strong hand of the arbitrary power, whether exercised by the sovereign or one of his petty chiefs. And so it was that in this new system, production for profit churned on, and when the Iliahi industry faltered and ended over over-harvesting of those valuable trees, the population of Hawaii was left devastated, both in spirit and in numbers. Diseases of European persons were running rampant through a population unprepared to defend itself, and the demands of grinding labor on the bodies and on the lives of the people led to a drastic shift in the expectancy of life. Estimates of the impact of the population of Hawaii's original inhabitants here before the arrival of European commercial interests 
are that the time of production for profit economy began in Hawaii with that trade up to the great Mahele when the Hawaiian islands were parceled out for private control and outright ownership. The number of Hawaiians had been reduced from 300,000 persons in Hawaii upon the arrival of these interests to just 7,500. And some of those that had been around had had enough. Enduring the changes that the Iliahi trade brought, then stomaching the indignity of the great Malehe, a new trade taking hold on the islands was starting to demand backbreaking, non-stop labor for cultivation, sugar. And the demands of this new enterprise, almost entirely controlled by interests from abroad, was more than some workers could stand anymore. And in 1841, just a few years after the first sugar plantation opened in Koala, a group of laborers, proud Hawaiians who knew the old ways, the ways of sharing what we were able to grow, of giving six days of labor a month, of feeling the value of one's own work on behalf of themselves and their loved ones, walked off the plantation. They stayed for eight days, demanding an increase of two cents an hour for their labor, and this was one of the first organized strikes in the history of Hawaii. But I'm willing to bet you probably know what happened the strike didn't work for the laborers. And though not formally organized into a union, the organization gave the owners of those lands a real fright. It, and it wasn't long before the plantation owners got themselves a plan. So over the decades that followed that initial walk-off on the plantation, the owners found that bringing in groups from all over the world in sequential waves of labor provided highly profitable advantages. With each new wave of labor from a different part of the world, the owners would pay the new arrivals less and less. This had the twin advantages of costing less labor on the one hand, but also it pitted groups against one another on the other hand. Sowing that kind of resentment against each new wave of labor for undercutting the previous wave's labor earnings could get in a day's work got harder and harder to bear. And this formed divisions along perceived lines of race and culture, which kept laborers divided and therefore more easily manipulated. Throughout these same decades, owners saw the enactment of laws that legalized or legitimized indentured servitude, which amounted to slavery in its practice but what once was legal, legal, didn't last for long. It was in 1900 when Hawaii became a territory of the United States, and these labor laws, tools of the sugar trade plantation owners used to fund their enterprise with as cheap a labor as possible, were deemed unconstitutional under the laws of the United States. And for some laborers, when they heard that their indenture was ended, they joyfully and happily walked off the fields forever. But many, especially those laborers brought to Hawaii solely to work in the sugar fields, they couldn't. They had no place to go, no other means of earning a living. So through organized campaigns, the owners continued to pit one group against another for a reason that was becoming more and more important to the owners, preventing unionization. See, throughout Hawaii, and beyond. Labor was unionizing and starting to make strides into many different industries, but no organization, no matter how hard they tried, could get a toehold in those sugar plantations. See, following the end of World War II, new labor laws made organizing easier. And between 1944 and 1946, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union worked with plantations on Hawaii so well and so strategically that on Sunday, September 1st, 1946, Labor Day weekend, 71 years ago, workers on 33 of the 34 plantations began to strike. Including families, more than 76,000 people stopped work 
and began a 79-day strike of any labor on the plantations. During that time, those 79 days, a structure formed among and across those perceived barriers of origin and heritage. Every person had a job to do, whether working on a strike committee, preparing food for those who were striking, or making sure that all of the news about that strike got to every single person who was involved in it. The open-hearted, open-handed spirit of caring for one another came to life once again and overwhelmed those close-hearted, close-handed tactics of the owners. The strike was successful in the short term, adding significant wages to those working on the plantations, but this combined effort struck a much more important blow. A participatory democracy, way of living, of decision-making, was coming back into the Hawaiian shores. And it was with this spirit that the very lines of communication and understanding across perceived racial lines that ushered in pro-union, labor-endorsed candidates in the local and territorial government elections in what amounted to a revolution we all know today of 1954. See, the labor organization on the sugar plantations led directly to the ouster of the Republican, commerce-focused leadership that had been in control of government in Hawaii for generations and generations. The tools of oppression, attempts to divide and differentiate groups of people, provided the very means by which that oppression would be brought to an end. See, what I have come to learn in a short time is that in Hawaii, Labor Day is not a celebration of cheap furniture or festooned parades. It is a celebration of recognizing our shared human family, recognizing what is under each one of our skins. It is a triumph of the interconnected web of life that we weave together. It is a victory of the democratic spirit pervading the way that decisions and cooperation can lead to a better life for one and then a richer life for all. Now, we would all be mistaken if we were to believe that the rights of farm workers are now carefully and dutifully protected by every employer everywhere. We heard just today in our story for all ages about the need for representing the rights of those who still suffer in the oppression in this industry. And even those organizations representing the rights of farm workers themselves struggle with issues of patriarchy and privilege to this day. In the film that was spoken about that opened this weekend, a documentary about the life of Dolores Huerta called Dolores, interviews that Huerta gave leading up to this release explain in her own words all the work that must be done by these organizations, within these organizations even, if justice is to be realized. It's very much worth seeing that movie. Because there can be no doubt about it, we have, all of us, our work cut out for us. Building that new way toward a shared faith of understanding is just a beginning. But by making that beginning, holding these inherent worth and dignity of every person, inviting, welcoming, needing the voices from all corners of every page of the book of life that we write together every day, the power of the families on those sugar plantations that they found by working across divisions involving every single person in the work is the very power that a Unitarian Universalist way of living, way of understanding, way of working together will need to thrive. But this is work that we do together. And it is not a labor of burdens. It can be a blessing of care. It does not have to be a labor of division. It's the courage that comes from a united community. And it is not a curse of discord or strife. It's a labor 
of love. Winding our ways through those streets of the neighborhoods, the roads of our cities, and the highways of the world, we dare ourselves as Unitarian Universalists daily to hold the news that we hear in the world in one hand and the news that we might offer the world in the other. At our very best, we work as Unitarian Universalists to deliver the good news of welcome, the joyful news of belonging, and the comforting news of loving one another not for who we might be someday, but for who we are right now in this place together. For the work of welcome, the work of belonging, and the work of love are for us gathered here together, truly all in a day's work. And may it ever be so. Blessed be. Amen.